All right, my friends, welcome back to another episode of the Build Show webinar. A little bit different of a format today. Uh, I want to welcome all of our uh, friends out there that are remoting in from all over the place. I suspect we've got all of North America over here. <laughs> yeah. Let me introduce you to these two handsome guys over here. Uh, first off, Michael Crane of the Rockwell. Uh, by the way, I like the black on black logo on the Rockwell hat. You can't tell, but that's actually a Rockwell logo on Michael's hat. Looking good, buddy. How do you feel today? Uh, feeling good. Feeling good. Yes, our R class builder program. So. Ooh, so if you so, join yeah. our class, you get a cool hat like cool that. Hat. Yeah, that's pretty cool. awesome. Uh, and then uh, Daniel, uh, better known as Glauser Build on Instagram. You probably have seen him on the gram with me before. Yeah. Uh, Daniel and I have been building houses a couple years together. Uh, and Daniel's going to end up being our main speaker today because Daniel is going to give you a little insight on his personal project that he is on the backside of, not quite done, but real close, uh, where he's utilized some serious, uh, amazing details and some awesome rock wool to build a pretty incredible house. Uh, Daniel, by way of kind of order of what's happening today, uh, I also, I forgot to mention too, I've got Allie coming to remote for us. Allie, give us a wave just so everybody knows who you are. Uh, Allie's in the tech department with Rockwell. He's remoted in for us. We're going to use him at the beginning a little bit and at the end on our Q&A session. But for the most part, uh, Allie's going to be hanging out in the background today. Uh, if you are watching this live, which I know I've got quite a few of you live on here, uh, and you're interested in asking us a question, we're going to leave at least the last 10, 15 minutes or so for questions. Yeah. Get on your Zoom app and ask a question through that Q&A tab. Don't use chat. I'm not going to be looking at chat, but I will be looking at the Q&A tab. So if you're on your phone, on your computer at home, do that. If you're watching this later in the recorded version, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. That's where we're announcing all these uh, webinars. We'd love to have you come on and join a live one and get your answers, get your questions answered. But with that being said, how about we uh, kick this off? Yeah. Ali, I want to have you go top of the hour here. I have a couple questions for you. Uh, just to kind of kick us off, you know, this is a Rockwell sponsored seminar, uh, webinar, and uh, no reason why we can't tell these guys a couple of uh, key things that we think make Rockwell different. But first off, I want to have you ask, or I want to have you answer rather the nerdy question that we're going to be talking about a little bit today, which is airtight and vapor open. Meaning when we build a house and we build it airtight, why is it beneficial to have that house in a vapor open? Meaning some type of exterior that has permeants to it that can uh, move moisture from the outside in or inside out. Would you answer that for us, Ali? Oh, definitely. First of all, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here with, the, with a bunch of smart people. We're gonna nerd out on some building science and I'm really happy to, to be here. So, uh, great question and th uh, thank you for that. It's uh, it's we always say like make your buildings airtight and make them some say big and breathable i know some people they might might disagree say no we used to build buildings and they were air a lot of air leakages and they for so many years and they why do we have to do this now this is gonna compromise our buildings but remember few things first before they didn't use the same material that we have now we use sensitive materials in our buildings. We literally use paper in some of the materials. And it, paper is an organic material and it's food for mold. So let's keep in that mind. We're, it's a different strategy of building. So having our building airtight is not only by how, how much air exchange between the interior and exterior. Is We need to think that air before it goes from the interior to exterior or from exterior to interior is going to pass through your walls, your roofs, or your, your envelope. And you should think what it would gonna, how it's gonna impact my envelope. There's so many points we can talk about it. Why we need to build airtight buildings is because of energy efficiency, because of uh, the health of occupants, and there are many other points to talk about. But to touch on your point when you said why does it need to be vapor permeable? So. As I said, building with sensitive material, and so there is a threshold of each material. How how much can it deal with moisture, and what is the moisture content? Some materials can can absorb a lot of moisture and and can uh, can be okay for such a long time. But some of them, uh, they are very sensitive. Like if you take for example our uh, the gypsum sheet. Uh, sorry, not the gypsum sheet. That we're talking about residential. So I'm going to talk about OSB. OSB is made of food at the end of the day, and stuff 
pasta's made of wood. We have the dry one, the interior side with paper, but all these uh, uh, materials, they have different threshold for dealing with moisture. And, uh, and we want these components to be dry at all time because higher relative humidity, higher moisture content could lead for degradation of materials. For example, if we take the OSB sheathing, the recommendation in the industry is to keep the moisture content below, uh, below 16%, or some might say even you can go, okay, 20%, but we need to, to have that threshold there because if we leave it wet and damp for a while, then we'll have more, uh, malt growth, degradation of our structural components. And if we don't have the structural components, we don't have a building at the end of the day. And also when we look at our uh, uh, interior gypsum uh, board, uh, if, if there is an accumulation of moisture, that could promote the growth of mold. And this is not something, uh, it, is, it's, it's, it has a, an, an impact on our health uh, especially the occupants' uh, uh, health. So there are many points why do you want it, but I, if I would summarize it now, for the health of the occupants, for the durability and, uh, and uh, of our structure, and, uh, and, and, and for a better uh, practice of building that we learned throughout the years. Awesome, Ali. Really appreciate your time, brother. Hang on till the, uh, till the end, Ali, because I know we're going to need you again when we get to Q&A, but... Uh, I want to switch over to you, Daniel. You know, as we talk about this airtight vapor open, that's exactly what you built. Yeah, that's uh, right. And your previous house was not very airtight. Uh, it was plenty of vapor <laughs> open, uh, but it was not. It was all kinds of open. Airtight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Daniel, why don't you jump in and give us a little bit of a tour of your project? Okay. And, uh, and give us some takeaways from that. Okay, absolutely. Um, well, so yeah, what we did is we, we have a house that was built in 1977, um, and as you had mentioned, it was not airtight whatsoever. Um, we had basically vertical um, siding that uh, had some tar paper behind it, and that was it. And did you do a pre-blower test on this house? I, I did, and surprisingly, it was 6.7, which oh. was better than I expected. Um, but still pretty awful. But still pretty bad. That's right. Um, but yeah, so we came into this project with the goal of upgrading the exterior. Uh, as we mentioned, I live in the house. Um, we made that decision to stay in the property uh, as opposed to going out and renting something else and take that money and put it into the project. Um, and so doing that um, was a challenge from a process standpoint, um, but also also from a uh, scope standpoint as well, what can we accomplish while we're living there? Yeah, um, and and uh, remember that, live in the process, because I'm gonna ask you a question about that at the end. Yeah, for sure. And we'll come back to that for everybody watching. For sure, and then, so one of the other goals was to, it wasn't actually an original goal, but once we got into the process, decided we wanted to uh, reach Passive House. Um, I had contemplated building it to Passive House standards. We did a bit of modeling and determined that it was possible. Um, and Rockwell was definitely key in getting us there. Very cool. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned in the goals, one of the things uh, with the Passive House principles that there's a few of them, but I'm only going to talk about a couple today um, that are kind of pertinent to the conversation, and that's um, the thermal control layer, which is our insulation layer. And in Passive House, uh, the two tenants of that are the high-performance high enclosure, which includes exterior insulation and lots of interior insulation. Of course, depending on what climate zone you want it, are in, it varies. Um, and then also eliminating thermal bridging. And thermal bridging is any instance where um, you have that transfer of thermal energy from the outside to the inside that somehow is getting past uh, your insulation. So the continuous insulation on the outside definitely goes a long way in helping that, but there are still some components that will kind of bridge that and get through that. Yep. And so we try to minimize those things. And then the other thing we're talking about a little bit today was uh, that, as Ali mentioned, air tightness is extremely important. Um, so we used a zip system sheathing and their zip tape uh, in order to be our air control layer. And um, basically wrap the house with the new skin. So take off the old skin and put a new skin on and then put our insulation and then put on um, our cladding. Can I ask you a question about that real quick yeah. before we move on? I hope you don't mind me interrupting. No, 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 anytime. You know, we're talking about this kind of airtight vapor open. For sure this is an airtight assembly. Do you happen to remember what the specs are on vapor permeance 
with the zip system between the tape and the uh, and the sheathing? I don't offhand remember what that is. Do you is. know, Michael? I can't remember either. I want to say it's it's it is permeable. It's not a barrier. It uh, is permeable. That's I want correct. I say it's between ten and twenty, but I'm not sure. That's where I think it. Before. That's where yeah. I think it runs into. Yeah. It's a lower perm. It's not a super high perm. Yeah. But it's in it's in that range of I suspect ten to twenty perms. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, so um, going back to the air tightness, when you do build an airtight house, you still need to ventilate it. Um, and you need to manage for moisture inside. Um, so, you know, the way you do that is mechanical ventilation. You bring it in where you want to bring it in, not through the wall assembly. That's right. <laughs> um, but through a filtered opening um, where you can condition that air uh, using an ERV or an HRV, depending where you are. Yep. <clears throat> and then also using um, dehumidifiers. Yeah. And by the way, I, th I, I feel like you guys understood this, but this is in Austin, Texas. Daniel lives about five miles from our office here. So this is right around the corner from where we're filming today. Yeah, exactly. Um, so going in a bit to, of the process of what we did, uh, this outside in remodel, um, for most of the house, we were able to keep the sheetrock intact on the inside um, so that we could stay in the house mm -hmm. um, and then peel off that exterior and peel off the, you know, what was some insulation in some parts of the house um, reframe window openings where we needed to. We mostly kept things the same, but we did change some. Um, and then we could then go back in and we could um, add, oh, let me skip forward one more. We could add our uh, rock wool insulation from the outside in mm -hmm. um, uh, and then put our, um, our sheathing on the outside and, and create that air control layer. Hang on that slide for one second. I have a question for you, Michael. Uh, we don't see typically outside installed insulation on bays. No. There's there's no difference though, right? I mean, in terms of installing it, I mean, the, the nice thing about it is there is no inside face or outside face, right? Correct. Correct. So, so uh, I mean, I actually like from a retro standpoint, I like this method of um, remodeling an older home because you get a chance to really uh, control that air barrier. Mm -hmm. Like we, you know, uh, our, thermal, our thermal layer is only effective as our air barrier. So the more we control our air barrier, the more we limit any kind of airflow into our structure. Mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. our, thermal, our thermal envelopes can be more effective. With yeah, the yeah rock wool goes from a great insulator to a great filter when there's airflow <laughs> that's through right. there. And, and that's not what it's intended for. Yeah, that's all. right. Um, but, but the truth is, you're right, in, in this instance, you're pushing it up against the dry, back side of the drywall. In a yeah. typical installation, you're pushing it up the back side of the sheathing. Yeah. Um, so there really is, there's no, no difference there. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but one of, one of the key things that we did in this project uh, in order to control all of those things, both the thermal and the air tightness, um, is we did what's called a chainsaw retrofit. Mm -hmm. So we came and we cut off um, all of the existing eaves that are there. Um, so that we could have basically an uninterrupted plane change from the wall up to the roof. So we can control our air barrier, but then also our insulation can go continuously as well. It's retrofitting monopoly framing, right? That's exactly you know, right. These guys have seen me build my house with monopoly framing. Several of the Reisinger build projects have had monopoly framing. Uh, this is just retrofitting that. Mm -hmm. And I think it was probably Joe Stebrick that coined the phrase chainsaw retrofit. I think the first one was done with an actual chainsaw. I think that's right. Yeah, they literally chainsaw the eaves off. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's back to Joe Stebrick's perfect wall concept, uh, which is basically let's frame a roof and a wall the same. Uh, let's make there be no continuity break between the wall all the way to the ridge. And that allows Daniel to really control that air tightness super well. It also, you'll see in a minute, I'm, I'm sorry I'm giving it away, but I think people know. It also allows us to have fantastic continuous exterior insulation on the entire exterior envelope of your house, which is so unusual on a, on a remodel situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, for, for those people that aren't super familiar with this and do know a lot of the things that we say is we love white overhangs and everybody's like, oh, why would you cut that off? That's right. Don't worry. That we're, not gonna, we're not going to leave it that way. <laughs> yeah, they're coming. That's right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, one of the other things is the, the house itself, I'm working with an existing footprint and existing geometries, and it was complex. I don't know that I would have designed it this way to begin with. So yeah. this really helped us get, simplify things um, from an air control standpoint. Um, then, of course, uh, we did install all new windows. Um, these are the Shuko triple pane windows. 
Um, you can see this instance here, there's no insulation. We did have a couple of additions that we put on the house. Mm -hmm. um, so those we just insulated traditionally from the inside. So um, these are uh, made in Europe, super high R value, probably R7 or so, I suspect, or yeah. maybe R6. On average, it's a U value of like 1.1. 1 .1. Okay. So it's pretty good. Holy cow, it's yeah. even higher than that, maybe more like yeah. R8 or higher. Yeah. Uh, sourced through the Boston Company European Architectural Supply. That's correct. And uh, if I remember correctly, you also used a slightly different zip tape on those windows, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, normally when you're using um, a flangeless window like this, it is typically set in. Um, normally you have a thicker wall assembly. Mm -hmm. We've only got two by four walls here. Oh yeah, okay. So in order to get a nice reveal on the inside where we wanted to, when we knew we were building up the outside layers, we ended up running those flush with the sheathing. Gotcha. Um, which is good because then you don't necessarily need a, a separate head flashing because mm -hmm. it's all in the same plane. That's nice. Um, and, but it does make it a bit more exposed. So I went ahead and I used the zip tape, uh, the vapor permeable zip tape, and I actually taped all four sides. Yeah. Um, Which blows our mind a little bit as builders in America. We're not used to taping. We're used to telling people, don't tape the bottom, that's yeah. a mistake. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's, um, there were instances where we had some failures, and although it did, did water did pool on the inside, I have sloped sills, mm -hmm. um, as we normally do, uh, it wasn't an issue. It did dry out, but um, water was getting in there and sitting in there. So I'm not sure if I were to do this again, if I would tape the bottom. Um, um, the flip side of that is because of the pace of this project, I was able to identify and fix all of those that's leaks. Um, but that's not to say that they won't ever happen again in the future, although I yeah. have taken some other steps to mitigate that. You know what I did on, my, uh, on the, the house I built on Flagstaff? that were the same exact windows, same color and everything. We taped the bottom flange, but at the at two spots on the bottom, I didn't pull the backer off. Oh, smart. Um, I taped them at the top, but I, I left the backer on the on the bottom two thirds of the yeah. tape. Yeah, that's a great so idea. So that it was tight, but if there was a small amount of incremental moisture, it would have a spot to weep yeah. out where there wouldn't be Just a little adhesive. flap. So basically like a little flap. <laughs> I fall over here. I got so excited about that detail, I almost fell off my chair. How do we control for that? The nerdery is pretty thick here. Sorry, y'all. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, uh, we had a few additions to increase the, the footprint of the house. Um, and that was sort of just, you know, traditional framing that we added on. But you can see from a process standpoint, like in this middle picture here, uh, my kid's bedroom is on the other side of that wall. So we basically left this wall entirely intact until all of this was framed in and dried in. Wow. And then we removed that wall. Oh so, um, you know, it, it, it took a lot of planning and a lot of thinking and, uh, and some extra time as well. Heck yeah. Um, That's awesome. But, um, yeah, so there's just some progress photos. Also, uh, before you leave that, also an interesting note, there's temp stairs right there too. Yeah, right? I'll, get to you had, I'll get to did that. I'll get to that. Did you say that? Okay, yeah, um, Keep going. Those are not the only ones. <laughs> <laughs> Love um, okay, yeah, so going to sort of, once we have our sheathing on, our air tightness, our, our weather barrier is in place, um, then we're going to build out that wall assembly from there, and this is where we're going to add our exterior insulation. Um, we used it Two inches of comfort bat, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, comfort board, 80. And uh, but before we installed that, we installed the hitch system by Longboard, and that is going to be the attachment points for our cladding system, which we'll see in a minute. Um, and what's unique about this product is um, they really think about thermal bridging and trying to minimize that. So they've got stainless steel standoffs, they've got composite shims, they've really thought through how to space these to minimize the number mm -hmm. of attachment points. That's cool. Um, which is a great system, and then it makes it easier for us to install our rock wool after that, because our grid is laid out, um, and then we just cut little holes around it and slide it on. I uh, also notice you've got uh, these black cat fasteners. I think those are from uh, Truefast. From Truefast, yeah. yeah. How do those work out? Pretty well? Yeah, those are fantastic. They're great. They've got a little tube um, actually on the fastener itself that's, um, I think, two and a quarter inches, knowing that we have the two inch rock wool. So then when you attach that fastener, it squeezes that little tube and actually seals the penetration. How about that? That's yeah, cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Uh, can I ask Michael a quick question yeah. while we're on the slide? Uh, Michael, he mentioned he's got Comfort Board 80. What are the sizings on that? And are there other options besides 80? 
So yeah, so so comfort board eighty is uh, you can get it in one inch thick all the way up to five inches thick. Okay. Uh, as far as different products, we have comfort board eighty, which is eight pounds per cubic foot. Oh, that's where that eighty comes from. Yep, that's where the eighty comes from. We also have a comfort board one ten that's eleven pounds, and that's what we're using on the mass buy project. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So, so higher density, that. probably higher uh, or less compressive. That's right. Heavier, you know, usually usually it's used for heavier cladding systems and stuff like that. Gotcha. So that makes sense. Is there a, a difference versus a, horse, a vertical or a horizontal surface in far as the yes. application? Yes. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. So, so when we get to the roof side of your build, yes, it, the the pitch is what dictates mm -hmm. what product. Right. So for eighty, anything with a roof pitch of four twelve and above. Is fine. When we get to 112 to 312, we'd go to our comfort board 110, and anything that's flat roof, we go to our roofing product, which is a top rock product. Oh, right, I've that's seen cool. that. Yeah. Let me, let me, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to make you blush for a second. One thing that's really <laughs> awesome about Rockwell is they have lots of Michaels uh, stage around the country, and so it was great to have Michael in Austin. But Michael also works with other Texas builders, and so Daniel is able to say, "Hey, this is the project." Uh, can you help me with this? And I, I'm none of this is a side note, but would you guys talk about that just briefly? Um, oh, because absolutely. Because you, you had Rockwell do a bunch of calcs for you and product selection, and they were pretty intimately involved long before you broke ground, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think one of the most valuable parts of this whole process is having partners like Michael on board um, because I've never built this particular house before, right? Yeah. And that same goes true for any project that we're on. And so in, invariably, we're going to have lots of questions, and he knows the answers to those questions. So being able to have somebody just at the other end of a phone um, to reach out and say, hey, this is what I'm planning. Can we get together? He came to the site before we started, walked through everything. Yep. I said what I was going to do, and he was there to help um, figure it all out for us. Yeah, one of the things I like about you, Michael, uh, we've known, I've known you a long time, even before you worked for Rockwell. But uh, I've always appreciated how if you don't know the answer to my question, You'll say, you know, I don't know, but let me get back to you. Yeah. Uh, and you always have over the years. Yeah. I really appreciate that about you. I mean, that's what we're looking for in a great relationship between a builder and manufacturer. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why I think Rockwell as a company has done so well is there's a lot of people like you there that are willing to work with and help builders like us and you get back to us in a timely fashion. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate both both of what y'all said. I mean, I, I try to know as much as I can. Sometimes <laughs> I, sometimes y'all can stump me. Uh, a lot of builders can stump me. Um, but, you know, all, all the builders out there, I, I get to see some fantastic pro projects yeah, some across Texas and, and the rest of my region as well. And so... Uh, re really enjoyed working hand in hand with you. Not only you, but the architect tech firm, uh, Forgecraft. It really, you know, it's kind of the brainchild behind how to get a 1970s home to a passive, you know, passive status. It's pretty awesome. So. Yeah. All right. Sorry to interrupt, Daniel. We'll no, side note there. No worries. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I think we're done here. I think I talked about all of those things. If you're done here, then if this is your last slide, let me ask you one more question. Uh, not the last slide, but done with this slide as well. Okay, I got you. Then let me ask this one because yeah. I know people are thinking it. Is there any concern with that rock wool getting wet yeah, on that's outside a, of your building? That is actually a great question. And one of the big reasons why I wanted to use rock wool on this project, um, I'm doing this as a side project. So the pace of this project is not the typical pace of a project. So I knew that I was going to have to do things in stages and it may take a while. Um, and so I was worried about that. If I put on exterior insulation and it rains, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Well, the beauty of this is it doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't matter at all. Um, it can get soaked with rain and it just, the next day, it's gone. It's dry again because yeah. it doesn't soak into that um, rock wool itself and it just drains right out of it. Um, and there's no, um, any biological stuff in there, so it's not gonna grow mold, it's just rocks. That's pretty well, awesome. I'll add to that, I heard a statistic on, ap after you clad the whole house, you know, behind that cladding, you know, about maybe 9% of water that hits the cladding can go through to that next layer. So adding, you know, a rigid board, comfort board on the outside, then 9% of that 9%, gets behind on the uh, other yeah. side of that drainage plane, which is our WRB in this instance. So, yeah. so it really helps out the zip system, any kind yeah. of imperfections you have right there. Yeah. So. yeah that's and the other thing that I think is worth mentioning at this point too, is you see that continuous rock wool on the outside and you think, oh, you know, am I worried that if I did need to dry to the outside, not as big a deal for us in Austin, but if you're building this house in a cold climate, 
one of the big beauties of this is this is really one of the few materials that you can use for exterior insulation that's very vapor permeable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's no issues with vapor moving through it. So this is an excellent exterior. But for us in Texas, one other cool thing about this, Daniel, that I learned not too long ago is there's a great tech bulletin. I might ask Allie about this at the, at the end of the hour where they tested termites uh, and kind of termite resistance. Because when I first heard about people using this below grade, I thought, oh, that seems like a bad idea, right? What if termites tunnel through it? Uh, but you know what? They did a study on that. Uh, and like University of Louisiana, where the termites are awful, and they found the termites will not, they don't like it. They get their bodies torn apart, is, is my builder version of it. We'll let Ali <laughs> say the, probably the correct version later. But, yeah. uh, but they didn't like it. Yeah. So that, that's kind of cool. But it's a good point. I mean, if it is rated to be below grade, getting rained on on the side of a wall is not a big deal. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, so yeah, so after that, uh, one of the, the things, I guess you, you can kind of see in this picture, but not really, um, but my house is in a fairly wooded area. Mm -hmm. um, it's in a residential area, but behind my house, there's actually eight acres of open wildlands. Wow. And so um, while it's not a huge uh, wildfire area, it is a possibility. So one of the things that I was wanting to achieve with this house was some security on the end of uh, wildfires. And of course, um, rock wool doesn't burn. Um, and so that was a, a great benefit as well. Yeah, that's um, awesome. So after we put on our rock wool, we then um, put on this girt system by longboard that I talked about earlier. And then our aluminum siding went over that. We have about an inch and a half rain screen between the siding and, um, and our rock wool. Mm -hmm. And then as you can see here, we've got our eaves put on. So I took um, basically just some square tubing and we created some rafter tails. Um, and those got screwed down to the roof deck and the rock wool is basically around those for that extra three inches on top. That's awesome. So, looks awesome. Yeah. And it looks pretty tr pretty kind of modern traditional too, which I would consider this kind of mid-century modern, would you say? Um, it has aspects of it okay. for sure. Yeah. What, what yeah. would Forgecraft call this if, we, if they were here? I don't know. <laughs> I often, if you look at that first picture, to me, I've always thought of it as like a 70s ski lodge for some there reason. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> ski lodge. Ski lodge. I didn't know that was an architectural style. I don't know if it ski. is. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it is. Uh, so if we want to dive in. I'll just kind of show you briefly. We've kind of talked about all of this. But we had essentially, like I said, two by four walls. Uh, we have rock wool in the cavity. We've got our layer of uh, zip outside of that. Then we've got our clip system, uh, the hitch system clips, and um, our two inches of rock wool, that air gap, drainage plane, and then our um, longboard siding. Killer. Um, and then here is sort of the same eave detail that I talked about. This rafter tail comes up only two feet on top of the structure mm -hmm. and is bolted down into the rafters themselves, uh, the roof joists. And um, then we have rock wool that goes on top of that. We've got an air gap and then we've got our stain, uh, staining seam roof. Um, another challenge we had with this is the underside of the house. Right, My house is elevated. We've got about a nine foot crawl space in some places. Um, so that gets skinned with a zip system as well, and then we've got rock wool that goes under there also. So we're basically, that continuous insulation goes all the way around. Gotcha. Beautiful. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you briefly want to talk about some personal challenges we had here. I don't think I want to talk briefly. I want to talk at length about this part. I think this is going to be the most interesting for my builder friends in the audience. What was it like living while your house was getting remodeled? And by the way, I'd like to point out that a typical average uh, summertime temp in Austin in the middle of the day is what, 103? Yeah, this past summer, I mean, we reached 100, uh, over 100 for like 60-something days. In a row. Right? Yeah, and it's, uh, so and yeah. Nighttime was, temps in Austin, by the way, are? About 90 degrees, yeah. 92 degrees. It didn't, a, a doesn't cool times, off. It doesn't cool off. You don't go off. below the set point on your uh, air conditioner at night in Texas for yeah. many, many weeks or months. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we had some construction challenges, which I've pointed out here, and that's basically the, kind of what I talked about before, it's the complex geometry, um, lots of different um, sides that we have to get to marry up to be able to seal them all, um, and then different types of materials coming together. We've got steel beams, engineered beams, um, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and then in addition to that, we've got a lot of just haphazard plumbing that was in place and electrical and, you know, I'm wanting to seal all of that up. 
And so basically what I've done is I've removed all of the old plumbing and um, rerouted it so it comes out at a 90 degree angle. Um, but we're living there, so I had to do it <laughs> a little bit at a time, right? Yeah. So we can still flush the toilet in one room um, and not have it drain out into the crawl that. space. Yeah. 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 Do not use sign. Yeah, exactly. We did. Wow. I put I put tape over flush levers and <laughs> turn and, water off. And for the people watching who don't know your house, this is a, a pier and beam house. Pier and beam house. But some of the beams were steel beams that look like bridge beams. Yeah, this one here is two feet tall. I mean, and how long was that beam? I can't remember. Uh, or is that? It's still there. Forty-five feet long. Forty. I mean, that is a ginormous a giant beam. beam. Yeah, and it's not typical to our area. No. The houses are not built like that. This one just happened to be. Not normally. Um, was, we we have this theory around the office that was a leftover beam at the junkyard that someone <laughs> got a good deal on, so they use it on Daniel's it house. It could have been. It could have been. Um, <laughs> So then the sequencing of it all was, was difficult. Um, you know, we kind of, I, we had to move our family from place to place within the house. Mm -hmm. There was some internal um, kind of redoing of the footprint and we had some beams that had to come in and things yep. like that. So, you know, being able to cordon off different areas of the house, um, but then also ask the framers to do things they wouldn't typically do where they could get this part done, but then go over here so we could reroute some things. And so the sequencing mm -hmm. was pretty difficult. I'd like to point out that Daniel was married at the beginning of the project. <laughs> and is still currently married at, at this point in the project. Still yeah. currently, right? Yeah. And the truth uh, of it is, this is not the first time that I've done this. No, so my, no. my family is kind of yeah, you Although this might be the last one. This might be the last one. <laughs> and, he, and he started the project with three children and he had, at this point has not lost any children. <laughs> no one right. has been, uh, has fallen out of the building. Uh, that's right. So going back to what you talked about before was the temporary staircases. Um, I didn't know you had a whole slide on this. I love <laughs> Uh, um, but but the guys were great because so that on the far right there that was the first temporary stairs that we built um, my house is elevated the only way you can get into my house is by going upstairs mm -hmm. um, and so we knew that we were gonna have to tear off the front part of the house where the front door was so we built some temporary stairs in what ended up being a window but you know the rough opening was about the same we just framed it in after um, and then once that was done we took those front stairs and we moved them to the front of the house um, here, this was a this was to get in the back door. So there was a period of time where the only way in and out, you had to walk around the house <laughs> and go up the stairs. Um, and then now, actually, we've repurposed these stairs yet again because the front porch has been built, oh but we gosh. haven't done our steel stairs yet. Um, so we cut those in half and made it a two-step landing. But uh, oh, um, yeah, we've gotten hilarious. a lot of use out of those, those stairs. Those one temp stairs are, have been moved all around your house. Yeah. They? And I don't actually have a picture of it, I think, on this, but um, you know, having to walk all the way to the back, um, there were times when it rained. And so we actually took strips of, leftover strips of rock wool as our stepping stones. Oh, that's funny. To get around the house and not it. have to stand in the mud. Not be in the muddy, <laughs> muddy mess. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole other unintended use for rock wool, Michael. Yeah. It's another one for the but books. But it's made of stones, right? That's right, made of stones. Yeah. Stepping stones. Um, and then, so this one, I guess, is the, really the big one that people uh, think about when, when we talk about this project. And that's, um, what is it like? What does it feel like when yeah. you're living in the house? Yeah. And so, you know, there were, there were times when, you know, behind that plastic wall there, that's the outside. You know, you can see my staircase here and just an open wall. <laughs> and so um, I don't know exactly what the building science is on it, but a sheet of plastic is not a good insulator. No, that's not. <laughs> is there an R value for a, for a sheet not. of plastic, Michael? Maybe an R half. R, R point zero 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 one. Well, also it was black, so it was probably negative R. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. true. Heat. Solar uh, gain. Yeah, exactly. You actually would have been better off ha not having it. Yeah, anything. that's right. <laughs> Uh, but so you can see there was our, our air conditioning just couldn't keep up. So um, just in case you can't see this, let me verify I understand this correctly. The 93 is saying what temperature it was inside the house. And the 73 is what you were hoping. That's the set point of your thermostat. Yeah. <laughs> what happened when you took that picture? Was there was there an angry text message from your family about getting home? It's hotter than blazes. It's probably house, his honey. wife oh. sending that to him over the phone. No, I took the picture, but we definitely. I mean, it was like that for weeks. Is that right? That wasn't a one-time occurrence. Um, we had we did have a couple of temporary air conditioners set up in some key areas, and so it wasn't unbearable. It yeah. was just where the thermostat was. Yep. 
Um, but yeah, it would it would get up to 93, 95 degrees. Oh, oh my god! And then by the time morning rolled around, it may have gotten down to like 74, 75, something like oh, that. Oh my gosh, um, that's crazy. But yeah, it was it was, the summer was rough because we were in the midst of this stuff in the middle of the summer. Yeah. So you know, normally, Daniel, we tell people not to oversize their air conditioners, <laughs> but I would say if you know you have a big project like this coming up, you should at least get double the size of your air conditioner because look at 20 degrees. <laughs> your air conditioner couldn't even keep up between yeah. the inside and you know i should i should know it i'm not like torturing my family when it was really bad we did go stay other places yeah. um yeah. for some time here and there sure uh, we didn't just you know, live through it. Well, what's funny is you know when i'm i'm of the age i'm a little older than you not by much but when we were kids i grew up without air conditioning uh, now i didn't grow up in texas right but uh i grew up without any ac well, i was in high school and my parents put central ac in and they had a window rattler in their bedroom <laughs> And I was always like, how come I don't get a window rattle? My dad was like, you have a fan. What's wrong with that? <laughs> right? Open your window, son. Yeah, that's right. Now, on the other hand, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, often it would get in the 60s at night. But the, I still remember plenty of nights where it'd be 85 and you'd be trying to sleep, just sweating. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, so uh, it's, it's a different world we live in when we expect the house to be 68 degrees. I grew yeah. up just outside of San Antonio, and my dad built our house much like I'm doing here. And we lived in it before it was finished. Um, and I, the first summer that we were there, we hadn't put the air conditioning in wow. yet. And I lived on the second floor with a big single pane sliding glass door that faced west. Ooh. And my room just baked. baked. <laughs> that was a hot room. Yeah. So I am curious, uh, you know, for the builders out there uh, watching, you know, a lot of builders will do live in remodels. Some say we won't do live in remodels. Now that you've experienced this, uh, any advice for builders on how to coach clients to do what you did or not do what you did? Yeah, I mean, at our company, we just generally don't allow it. Yeah, we don't. Um, we won't allow it. Yeah, it's it's not a good idea if you're doing a substantial um, mm -hmm. project like this. Yep. Um, if you're doing it yourself, you really just have to have realistic expectations of what it's going to be like. Yeah. Um, in the past, uh, when I ran my own company, I did quite a few sort of small-scale renovations on people's houses while they were living in them. And it's a stressful time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think, a lot more than people think that it is because it's your entire life, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. there you go to work and you come home and your house is in disarray or it's hot or it's noisy or it's dusty or whatever. You don't have that peace, yeah. that um, sanctuary. Not, not everybody has the opportunity to move out. Sure. Um, so you do have to take that into consideration, but really just having realistic expectations and honest conversations with people about what it's going to be like. Yeah. Two things I, I wanted to mention on this, on this webinar and thinking about this, you know, when, when we have clients who say to us, Hey, we'd like to live in it while you guys do this remodel or addition, uh, you know, we tell them all the things, but then the analogy I always use is I'll say, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Homeowner, it's like being in jail. Uh, you know, at jail, you might have a bed and uh, you might get three square meals a day. But the hardest thing about being in jail is you don't have control of your schedule. And even though I'm going to tell the plumber to come at 8 a.m., he may show up at 645 and ring your doorbell. And those kinds of things feel like, you know, you're the, the jailer coming to wake you up out of bed. It's just you don't have control. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, though, for you personally, you're the builder, you're the homeowner, you're married. This is your family. I suspect that, you know, a family of five renting a house in Austin, Texas, it's going to be really hard to find a place for under, let's say, two grand a month. Oh, no, that's not possible. So, yeah. you know, if this is a year project, that's $25,000, you know, $24,000 yeah. that you can put into the project by doing this. Yeah, and even that, that would mean I would have to move away from where I live mm -hmm. and, you know, getting the kids to school, getting to work, all of that gets extended and it's a big inconvenience in addition to the cost. Um, so then looking at something close by, it's just really unaffordable. Yeah, yeah. Super interesting, man. Yeah. Was that your last slide? I think so, yeah. Yep. By the way, if you guys aren't following Daniel, go check him out at Glauser Build. He's our executive project manager. He's our head honcho on the building side of the world. Uh, and we're doing some fabulous projects that Daniel's yeah. taking pictures of all the time and throwing those out. So go check him out on Instagram. Yep. Um, we have a few minutes before I want to switch to uh, Q&A, Michael, but I wanted to ask you a couple of nerdy questions about okay. product specifically. Um, you know, as we think about exterior insulation, how does Rockwell, in your mind, 
uh, stand out versus the competition? What are some of the big benefits of exterior rock wool? So, you know, I've been, long before I even worked for rock wool, I've been selling rock wool. And, um, you know, it's really the attributes that go beyond the thermal performance. They have a superior thermal performance if you look R to R. Um, but, you know, the fire resistance, the sound absorbency, the water, the hydrophobicness of it, uh, the bug resistance, you know, th those are just uh, some of ours. It's a very dimensionally stable product. It friction fits in a cavity. I can install, as a, from a contractor point of view, I can install it and not really have to worry about down the road it's slumping in the walls and mm -hmm. not having an issue at my top plates. Yep. Um, so from a cavity standpoint, it's just a culmination of those things that I've, I've come across over the years that I've dealt with it and so um, before I decide to come on board with them. I will say that is one of the things that I absolutely love about Rockwell is being able to fill that entire cavity snugly and when it's in there, you know yeah. there are no gaps and that it's going to perform and it's going to stay that way. Exactly. And yeah. it's such a beautiful thing. It does <laughs> feel like a higher density product compared to other, let's say, for instance, bats we're talking about yeah. specifically now, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah compared yeah. to other stuff that we put in and yeah. friction fit in place. And I mean, it's yeah. nice. It's easy to cut because of that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, given that it's easy to work with, it's easy to get it right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, our product's made of stone. And if you look about look back over time, you know what you know buildings are still you know among us today. What are they made out of? They're made of stone. Yeah, um, that's a good point. And so from a durability standpoint alone, you know I love, and that's why I pitch like uh, continuous insulation all the time. I'm like, you know, it just adds durability. I yeah. was like, you know, if I, I was to build a house tomorrow, it's going to have it on from a durability standpoint, yeah. just because I want to see it years down the road. And I hope it's one of those houses that somebody like me comes along later down the road after I'm passed and going, man, this is a cool structure. <laughs> give, us your, uh, give us your analogy on uh, exterior insulation, Michael, because I've heard you say uh, a really fun analogy of why exterior insulation. What, what is that? Give that to us. So, so one presentation I'm working on is, is uh, jackets, jackets and koozies, um, continuous insulation for all climate zones. And so you know, we, we, we talk about jackets or we're up north in a colder climate, we put a jacket on. I mean, we could drink coffee and stay warm, but it's probably not very efficient. Um, just like in the south, when we go out and we have a glass of iced tea, what happens? It sweats on the outside of that glass or, or whatever cold beverage we have. Mm -hmm. And so we put a koozie on it yep. to keep it from condensating. Same thing happens in the south. So it's just as important in the south where mm -hmm. it's hot. For, as well as it's, it's just as important in the north. It's a great one. I really like the koozie. I hadn't thought about it. I always think of the sweater or the down jacket analogy, but the koozie is yeah, a good one, it's especially right. for us in the south where absolutely. it's really hot down here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Daniel, I wonder if I could ask you a couple of installation best practice questions. Sure. Uh, you know, with a lot of other types of exterior insulation, uh, I always think that we want to go two layers of insulation. Uh, and the reason being is a lot of insulations do have some tendency to shrink over time uh, and so by doing two layers if that top layer shrinks the bottom layer if the if the joints are staggered would cover over that and you wouldn't have a, a lack of insulation there yeah. i noticed on your house you only did one layer yeah. on the walls uh, is is there a reason behind that um yeah i mean it's because it's dimensionally stable um, and we used adequate fasteners it's not going to shift mm -hmm. so we you know went through um, sort of meticulous leveling of that first uh, layer mm -hmm. so that everything on top of that stacked neatly. Smart. Um, but it is, you know, there's just a little bit of give to that material. Mm -hmm. So once you have a piece in place and you slide that next piece, kind of press it in just slightly mm -hmm. um, and then put adequate number of fasteners in there and it's, that's how it's going to stay. Yeah. Um, so there wasn't really a need uh, in my mind to do two layers. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, over the summer, I think it was Rockwell Group over in Denmark, actually wrote an uh, article on how a contractor was doing a remodel on the Copenhagen airport and actually took a, out an 85-year-old piece of Rockwell. Oh, my gosh. Uh, wow. Original, original, I think it was 85. It may have been 65. I can't cool. remember exactly, but it's old. Yeah. And, and so they took it back to the lab and they tested it for its performance and it performs just like our that's amazing. Coming out of the that's pretty neat. That's amazing. So, yeah, that's really that's cool. cool. 
Made That's from awesome. rocks. Yeah. Rocks don't change. Rocks don't burn. <laughs> UV doesn't hurt rocks. Yeah. There's a lot of benefits to rocks on the outside. Yeah. That's for sure. Uh, I'm curious about fasteners, Daniel. We didn't really get into this too much in your presentation, but and you had a lot of different fasteners. How much time and effort was it on your part uh, trying to figure out like what fastener do I use? How many fasteners do I need? Like my guess is you don't have five inch fasteners on the shelf at uh, you know builders first source that you can just go grab. You had to like order that kind of stuff ahead of time. Yeah, that's right. How hard right. is that for you? That's right. It's not too bad. Um, you know, as uh, exterior insulation becomes more and more common in the residential world. Mm -hmm. Those products are more and more available. Yeah. You see them a lot on commercial side of things. Yeah. So you just kind of go through those avenues. Um, now on the Rockwell side of it, they do have technical information about um, what their recommendations are as far as what types and how many fasteners to do. Yeah. Um, but really, you know, you want that wide cap on there so mm -hmm. any fastener you put on there doesn't just go right through right. it. Right. Um, but um, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's not too difficult to get those things. Yeah. I noticed you had that true fast catalog in your desk. As I did, we were yeah. planning. Yeah. They do make some nice products. Oh, so many it's, good things. Yeah. It's we've TRU got fast, right? TRU F A S T. Yeah, that's correct. And their sister company is SPACs. That's right. Uh, so they've got all kinds of screw options and they, and they play nice together. So I noticed you use a lot yeah. of SPAC screws. I've got some really cool, um, uh, brick ties that actually, uh, go, Conjointly with the rock wool oh, exterior. Very cool. Pictures of it. Have so, you started brick yet on this project? No, not yet. Okay, not yet. Soon. It's on site. The brick is on site. Okay, good. So it'll be coming up soon. Awesome. Yeah. Love it. Well, it's uh, Q and A time. I got a couple questions on here already. If you are watching this live, go ahead and drop your question on that Q and A tab. Don't use chat, by the way. We're not using the chat. And if you're watching this later, uh, sorry for the lack of live questions. But you should be subscribing to our newsletter so you know when we have webinars. Actually, I'm gonna throw this first one out to you, Michael, and then I'm gonna uh, switch to Ali for quite a few of the rest. Uh, Michael, one of the questions is kind of an interesting one. Uh, why is Rockwool three inches and not three and a half inches? Is that is that a bat-related question or was that a comfort board question, do you think? I'm not sure because we have a three and a half inch bat. Okay. We also have three inch bats too. Oh, is that so right? Really so depends. you sell a three and a three and a half inch Well, bat. our safe and sound is three inch. Oh, there uh, you for go. interior cavities. Gotcha. Uh, we have a three and a half comfort bat for our thermal, like what Daniel used yep. on his project. Yep. Um, and But comfort board, I if it's directed at comfort board, I think he's right. I don't think there's a, or, or she's right. I yeah. don't think there is a three and a half. It would have to go double layer at that point, like gotcha. a two inch and an inch and a half. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I'll ask this to Allie as well, but I'm curious, and, and I hope you can answer this, but you know, behind you is Safe and Sound Bats here in our studio that, by the way, as a side note, we lined our whole studio. We basically studded out this commercial building with a stud wall in front of the commercial drywall that was in this space already, lined it with Safe and Sound Bats, and even though I have a concrete floor, a stucco wall here, this room sounds amazing. There's no echo in here. Right. And part of the reason why is we, uh, this wall is an open stud wall that you can see. The other three walls that are behind your camera, you can't see have black filter fabric on them, but it's basically still an open stud bay. And so we turned our studio into your sound tunnel, right. which a lot of people have been to at the IBS show and is like a total like, what? This it's is crazy. <laughs> it really is, yeah. It's so quiet. Yeah. Is there a difference? Uh, I mean, obviously there's some difference uh, between comfort bat and uh, safe and sound bats. There's a little thickness difference. And obviously the, the safe and sound is not R value rated. There's nothing right. on the bag. Uh, but is there some R value to that product? There's gotta be, right? Well, correct. And I'm glad you asked that because we get that a lot. I see it. I think I've seen it on some of your posts asking, no. well, I was told by my Rockwell rep or whoever representative that, that safe and sound has no R value. And while that is technically not true. It has thermal properties, right, right. but it's not tested as an R-rated product that right. you could use in mixed your cavity. Right, exactly. And that's really the difference between yeah. safe and sound and, and comfort bat. It, and I suspect it's probably tuned for sound attenuation too, rather than thermal performance, correct. Uh, like your exterior uh, product is. So I don't. It would be kind of fun. Maybe Alec could answer this. Is is there an R value? That, probably not published, and you wouldn't want to. Uh, 
Maybe I'll have to, maybe after the webinar ends, we'll have a beer. <laughs> that's, that's actually, that's how we get builders in the R class, Michael. You, tell, you come to the R class meetings, we'll, we'll tell you the real answer to that, but we can't tell you in public, it's probably where it is. It's All right, Ali, uh, I got a couple questions for you. You still, uh, you still back there, brother? Yes, sir, I'm here. So here's a, here's a nerdy question that I think is a pretty good one. Is there any R value per inch difference between comfort board 80 and 110 or is it just the compressive strength? Oh yeah, so it's just because of the density is higher when you go to 110, you're using more material. So this density is higher. So that will uh, it slightly reduce the R value. So comfort board 80, it's R 4.2 and comfort board 110 is R4. So the difference is actually is uh, is only R0.2 between the two products. So not a whole lot, in other words. No. Yeah. And that sense. was done just because of the density of each product. Yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. Uh, question came in for you, Daniel. Okay. Um, why did you choose to go passive house in Texas? And isn't it fairly uncommon there? Question mark. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there are three in now how many in, in how many Austin? rated ones are there yeah there are just a handful three that I know yeah of. just a handful of so, rated houses. yeah very yeah. uncommon yeah. indeed yeah. but um, you know we typically our practice is we build to a very high standard um, already which is you know what I was going to do with my house um, but I do appreciate uh, with the passive house standard um, the message that they get across and I know you know some people don't like labels but I think generally the public appreciates labels because mm -hmm. it's how we make sense of things right sure, sure. and so um, certifying this house passive uh, I'm able to then share that more readily with other people mm -hmm. um, you know whether I certify or not I probably would have built the house to the same standard yeah. Um, but then there's an, a, another benefit as well to certifying through FIAS, and that's the support that you get from them. Yeah. Um, they've got technical advisors, and you get a lot of information and help mm -hmm. um, throughout the process of you know, decisions to make and, and modeling questions. And um, that really is valuable for anybody, myself included, who's been building for a long time. Yeah, I think I'll jump in here too. I think there's something also to be said to on the the I guess the basis behind passive house. You know, a lot a lot of people I hear, well, I want to build two passive house standards, which is great, but the message behind passive house is is an affordability standard. Mm -hmm. Now we may be putting more high priced products, and and we may put more into the initial build, but over the time, if you look at a pie chart of the cost of a home and factor in your operating costs and your maintenance costs, those get outweighed and therefore you achieve that affordability that the passive house standard yeah. uh, uh, strikes to achieve. Yeah, and I think, you know, kind of touching on what you said, um, you know, passive house doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it really is paying attention to those details yeah. and, um, you know, the planning and modeling that you do ahead of time and really just executing on that. Uh, you don't have to use expensive products to do that. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, Ali, I've got one for you back at the uh, the tech desk here. Mark, a builder, it looks like in, uh, this must be Florida, I'm guessing. He doesn't say that, but he says, I have a concrete block wall that I would like to do exterior insulation on. How would you recommend that I do that? Also, I wanted to do a warm roof over a room addition can I add maybe like 10 inches of rock wool on the exterior top of the deck? Deck? Oh, he lives in Phoenix. I'm sorry, not Florida. I was guessing Florida. It turns out he's in Phoenix. <laughs> Ali, how would you answer those? Those are actually two questions for you. Great questions, and I love that topic. So uh, before answering, uh, I, I would like to refer to the perfect wall. So what is the perfect wall? Where all your control layers on the exterior side, including the insulation. So yes, when you put the, uh, the exterior, uh, insulation on the exterior side, it still is your best way to do it. Regardless of the climate, it is still going to be the best way to do it. And what I would always recommend is 
just a, a, a water resistive barrier on the exterior side, taped and sealed as an air barrier or then installed as an air barrier. Then you have your installation, your furring, and over that your cladding, or if you have a stock, or that will be a different approach. But at the end of the day, it's the same. You just need to uh, provide an air and uh, water resistive barrier behind the insulation, and that would be the best way to do it. Can you use uh, exterior insulation on the roof? Absolutely, yes, and uh, it's definitely the best way to do it. Uh, if it's in a, in a cold climate or hot climate, again, that's uh, that's going to be the best way to do it. I would like to say uh, if there is some interior insulation, then we would say, hold on a second, let's do some calculation. We are, we are here at Rockwell. We're more than happy to help with this calculation just to make sure that you put enough insulation on the exterior to meet a, a specific ratio of exterior insulation to total insulation R value to make sure that you control the risk uh, of, of condensation. Because if, if that's the case, if there's exterior insulation, I assume the attic won't be vented and there might be a risk of condensation based on the climate. But please reach out to us and we will help you. And we do have details for that if, if that's needed as well. Ali, can you share that contact info, or maybe you, Michael, like, is, is there a tech line, or is that readily available on the website for people to reach out? Oh, yeah. So, I, I, like, I'm, part, I'm uh, like, so I, I will give you a, a quick uh, answer for that. Yes, we do have a tech line. There's an email that you can send an email, technicalservice at rockwell.com, and that's where you can get uh, uh, answers right away, and I, we can share this information later as well. And also, we have a line that you can talk, uh, call, and talk directly to a, uh, a representative to answer your question. And on the, uh, this is the technical services part. Uh, and we have a building science uh, team, which is um, I'm managing at the moment, where we have a building science team where we offer other range of uh, of analysis and support that goes beyond our project because at building science we look at systems where the technical service will can give you all of the needs uh, all the support and needs about the project but at the end of end of the day we work as one team so where you can reach out to us in many ways the simplest way you can go online or you can just give a, a talk to one of our representatives on the field and they will put you in touch with us awesome Ali. appreciate that um I've got a question, uh, or actually, let me finish up uh, one thing on Mark's question. We were just asking about CMU. Uh, from my experience in visiting Florida builders, one thing that's really a game changer for those uh, builders building on CMU block is fluid applied weather barriers. Uh, you know, a CMU wall with, uh, you know, a Prosico Cat 5 uh, with a, a PolyGuard blue barrier makes a killer water and air barrier. And then you can fasten on uh, rock wool with uh, concrete screws and you can get those through uh you can probably figure out what to use through two fast yeah. spacks probably makes them uh and then you could also then fasten on put the rock wool on lightly knowing that you're going to put a uh let's say a one by batten on a wood batten you could even use treated battens if you were coastal or worried about water uh, and then you could simply nail on your cladding on top of that you brought up a good point. We actually have a new assembly design where you can actually put our board on. It's a new assembly for stucco. Oh, really? Where it just cool. goes right on. So CME block, you see a lot of stucco too. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, that's can great. we find that on the website, I suspect? Uh, I, I think it's on our partner's website, okay. Western Blended. Gotcha. On but gotcha. yeah, they have all the specs. I'm sure we, I, I don't know, Ollie could probably um, confirm if we have it on ours yet or not. Gotcha. Um, we are running out of time, and I've got a couple more good questions, but I don't want to miss one other thing. I think you have a slide for it, Daniel. Uh, Michael, will you tell us about this really cool uh, R-Class program that you guys have going on? So, yeah, part of our builder program, we're, we're giving away two houses for free this year. So uh, it's our one-and-done contest. All you got to do is, one, you got to be a member, so you got to join from this QR code here, uh, and then, then you just sign up for it with your project. That's cool. Uh, and, and if you are a member, you get invites to really cool stuff. Like, for instance, the International Builders Show this year. They had an awesome get-together at a private event. Uh, I got to hang out with, I don't know, 50 or 60 super cool builders. Uh, well, first night of the show, wasn't it? Was it yes. Tuesday night yep. yeah. this past year? We had a great time hanging with people and talking nerdy details. Yeah. 
Uh, so it, it really is a very cool program that you guys have put together. And to win a house full of insulation, that, that'd be pretty awesome. That's pretty to, awesome. To, to us, it's a community, you know. Yeah. That's why we just want to bring everybody together. That and, and, you know, I mean, we like to talk nerdy together and all yes, the stuff do. that makes sense <laughs> uh, to us. But, you know, it just comes from a general knowledge uh, standpoint and the educational aspect you get behind it. Because we put videos on there. We have... Um, articles, we do a uh, bi-monthly webinar where we talk about this, um, uh, this kind of stuff and project specific uh, stuff. So there's a lot of good ads. We also have a builder rebate program. So you use Rockwood, you can submit it at the end of the year and get a little cake back from us, directly awesome. from us. So that's a good lot stuff. Of good pluses from it. Uh, and lastly, Michael, I wonder if I could ask you, how can people find the Michael Cranes of the Rockwell world? Uh, or you, even you specifically, what's the best way to figure out who your local person is? Uh, well, there's four of us across the country, um, a team we're ever growing. Uh, but but uh, if you're if you're in my market, you know, just Instagram or or, or reach out to. I mean, the art class program, it's all on there. So. There you go. So good deal, awesome. guys. Really appreciate your time, Allie. Thank you for remoting in for us. For all of you in the audience that were live, I appreciate it. I'm sorry we weren't able to quite get every question. We do uh, capture your info, though, and I'm going to ask my Rockwell folks that are behind the scenes to get back to you. That's Chris Josh and uh, Chris Nicholson who asked some questions and weren't able to get to those. I appreciate all the questions, guys. And if you, again, if you're watching this later, thanks for joining us. I uh, really appreciate Daniel opening up his life and his world <laughs> to my us. Pleasure. Uh, my pleasure. His <laughs> mistakes and his awesomeness all at the same time. Super cool project, man. I'm super excited to see this finish up. Hopefully, we'll get over there and do a build show with that final blower door to just show how you nailed it at the, at the yeah, end. Yeah, let's it's, do that. That'll yes. be fun. It's an amazing house. And thank you to Rockwell for sponsoring. This is a fun webinar. We get to talk lots of nerdy details. And I appreciate these guys letting us talk about fasteners and passive house and all kinds of other things that have nothing to do with Rockwell, even though they paid for this uh, webinar and paid for our time to be here. So that's that's the kind of partners that we really appreciate at the Build Show. Like-minded companies that make great products that we would use no matter what, but we get to partner together to encourage you guys out there in the building community to build better houses. Because you know our slogan is, no better, build better. With that being said, you guys follow us on the Facebook or the Instagrams. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show.